This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course on schemes and will be about the definition of Ve and Cartier divisors. So um, we saw last lecture that if we've got a curve C over the complex number, then a divisor is a formal sum NIPI of points PI in C. In other words, you just take the points of C as the basis for a free abelian group. And if we've got a meromorphic function, um, F, then we have a divisor F, which is given by um, sum of Ni Pi, where Ni is the order of the zero of F at Pi. Um, and what we want to do is to generalize this to all varieties. We want to define divisors and we want to have a map from meromorphic functions to divisors, whatever meromorphic functions mean. And there are two sorts of divisors. We can have V divisors, or we can have Cartier divisors. Um, so the names V divisor and Cartier divisor were actually int probably introduced by David Mumford in his book Lectures on Curves on an Algebraic Surface. So here, I think, lecture nine, you can see the um, original introduction of the term Cartier divisor here. Um, he, he didn't introduce the notion of Vey and Cartier divisors. These have been introduced earlier by possibly Vey and Cartier, I guess. Um, anyway, um, um, uh, so let me first give a sort of overall summary of what's going on. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce a group of Cartier divisors. And this will map to the group of V divisors. And the, the group of V divisors is often denoted by div for divisor. And this will map to a group of V divisor classes and it's the quotient of the V divisors by, um, well, it's quite often by uh, a field K star. Let, let's sort of just assume the, the scheme X is integral for simplicity. And Cartier divisors also have um, a map from rational functions on the scheme to them, again, assuming the scheme is integral. And the quotient is going to be a group called the um, Cartier divisor class, which I always get confused about it being calcium chloride. Um, so moreover, Cartier divisor, the, the group of Cartier divisor classes is very closely related to the group pick of invertible sheaves. Um, so these are the groups we're going to be considering. And um, quite often, these maps here are often isomorphisms. They're isomorphisms whenever the scheme is reasonably well behaved. In particular, it should have, if, if it doesn't have singularities and has some other mild properties, then, then all these three groups are actually naturally isomorphic. And similarly, this map here is often but not always an isomorphism. Um, and the difference in philosophy is that Cartier divisors are somehow given by, um, they sort of look like locally like the zeros of a function. Um, or poles of a function, whereas V divisors sort of look locally like co-dimension one, 
irreducible subsets. And you may think that the zeros of a function are just the same as a union of irreducible subsets, and you're mostly right, which is why Cartier divisors and Vey divisors are really quite similar. Um, so let's first um, define Vey divisors on scheme X, and let's assume X is notarian which covers almost all cases. And if X isn't notarian, things really get rather tiresome and technical. So the Vey divisor is just the free abelian group generated by co-dimension one irreducible subsets. Of, of, of the underlying topological space of X. So this corresponds to points or closed points on a curve, which is what we had before. Um, and um, we're sort of going to, let's assume X is integral, which is not necessary, but is, covers, again, covers most cases and avoids a certain amount of complication. Then it has a function field K consisting, um, is, for, for, I mean, for any open set, you can take the, take the, 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 the field of quotients of it. And these are all isomorphic of X is integral. Um, um, and then we get a map from K star to the group of divisors. And all this does is it takes a function F to sum over all um, co-dimension one irreducible subsets of the order of the zero of F at P times P. So this is essentially what we did for curves. And the problem is, is this well-defined? Um, so first of all, um, we, we need this sum to be finite. So this sum is finite. Um, essentially because um, F is equal to zero or infinity on a proper closed subset. And um, since the scheme is notarian, a proper closed subset is going to be the union of a finite number of irreducibles. So you only get a finite number of, of varieties P turning up here. A slightly more subtle point is we, we sort of casually said the order of the zero of F at P. Well, what on earth is the order of the zero of F at a point P? So we can ask what is the order of the zero of F at um, P, where P is a co-dimension one point. Well, if P is reg, if, if P is, if the, if um, the variety is non-singular at P, so if the local ring at P is a discrete valuation ring, um, which is what Hartshorn assumes, this is easy. We just take the valuation of F. So you remember for a discrete valuation ring, it has a valuation which can informally be thought of as the order of the zero of a function at that point. Um, in general, um, you have to be a little bit more careful. And what we can do is we can define the order of the zero of F at P to be the length of R over F, where R is equal to the local ring at P. So R is a one-dimensional local notarian ring. Um, 
and um, if um, th there's no problem doing this because f is a non-zero divisor because we've assumed the scheme is integral. If the scheme isn't integral, you have to fuss around about being careful to take f to be a non-zero divisor, but we won't worry too much about that. And um, now we have a following problem. Is the order of fg equal to the order of f plus the order of g. I mean, by the order, I mean the order of the zero at p. And this follows by looking at the following exact sequence. We just take naught goes to r over g, and then we multiply it by f, and we get r over f g, and then we just map this to uh, r over f goes to zero. So the length of r over g plus the length of r over f is the length of r over fg, which is what we wanted. So, so this shows that the map from k star to the divisor class group is a homomorphism of groups. Um, so can we work it out? Well, in general, it's a bit tricky but there are some cases when it's quite easy to work out. So suppose um, A is a unique factorization domain. Um, then um, co-dimension one subsets. So co-dimension one irreducible subsets of the spectrum of A just correspond to primes of A um, in the naive sense that it's a, every element of A can be written as a product of primes. And for any divisor, um, so, so the, 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 the group of divisors is just the free abelian group on the primes. And now we can work out the group of um, divisor classes. The group of divisor classes is just zero because any divisor is principal. Um, so, I mean, if we've got a prime, then more or less by definition of a unique factorization domain, there's some prime in A corresponding to it. I mean, sorry, the co-dimension one prime ideals correspond to prime elements of the ring A because it's a unique factorization domain. Um, and if you've got any divisor, sum of n i p i, then this is principal because you just take the product of p i to the n i, where here p i is the prime ideal and here p i is the um, element generating the prime ideal. Um, so, um, for an example where it's not trivial, suppose A is a Dedekind domain. Then you can see that the ideal class group, which is the divisors, modulo principal divisors, is exactly what number theorists call the ideal class group. And there are plenty of examples of Dedekind domains where the ideal class group isn't zero, for instance, z root minus five. So for z root minus five, the group of Ve divisor classes is non-zero. In fact, it happens to be of order two as we've well, uh, I think we showed there were two different elements of it earlier. We didn't quite show it was a order exactly two. So there are plenty of examples where the group of Vey divisor classes is, is trivial and plenty of examples where it's non-trivial. Um, now let's look at Cartier divisors. And the definition of Cartier divisor looks a bit technical at first sight, but I'll point out 
after giving this technical definition that's in practice it's usually much easier so what we do is we define a sheaf k on x which is the sheaf of total quotient rings so what you do is for any set u you first of all map it to the total quotient ring of O of U, which is equal to O of U, um, where you um, invert all non-zero divisors. Um, and this is a pre-sheaf. And we take the corresponding sheaf. Well, what on earth does this look like? I mean, it sounds like a rather complicated construction. Well, in practice, it's nearly always can be given a much easier description. Suppose X is integral. Um, then all we're doing is we're taking each open set U to K, where K is the function field of, of X. Um, this is for u not equal to the empty set. For the empty set, we just take u to zero. So this apparently rather complicated sheaf is in practice just a rather complicated way of specifying the function field of x, at least when x is integral. You need this more complicated construction if you want to look at Cartier divisors of non-integral schemes, but we won't worry about that too much. Um, and then... This sheaf has a subsheaf O star, goes to K star, where this is just the units of O. And this gives us a quotient sheaf K star over O star, goes to zero. And a Cartier divisor is just a section, global section, of K star over O star. Well, what does this mean for integral sheaves? So, sorry, for integral schemes. Well, all this means is you cover your scheme by a finite number of open sets, say so ui, uj, and uk. And on each of these open sets, you choose an element ki of the function field, Okay, K. Um, and um, Ki over Kj has to be a unit of um, O on Ui intersection Uj. So um, um, furthermore, if you, if you multiply these elements Ki by units, that doesn't change the, the Cartier divisor. So you can think of the Cartier divisor as being something like the zeros of Ki, at least if the scheme is non-singular, as we will see a bit later. Um, so for example, let's find the Cartier divisors of an affine line, just to see what's going on. Well, we have a map from Cartier divisors to Vey divisors, because on, um, on any open set UI, we can just, um, we've got a, we've, we, 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 we've got some set Ki, and on UI, you can just map Ki to the corresponding Vey divisor on Ui. And since um, Ki and Kj have the same zeros on Ui intersection Uj, this gives a map from Cartier divisors to Vey divisors. So for the affine line, let's see what happens. Um, well, the map from Cartier divisors to Vey divisors is obviously surjective 
in this case, because a V divisor just consists of the point, I mean, V divisors are linear combinations of points on the affine line. And for each point on the affine line, you can just take a function vanishing at that point, and that will give you a Cartier divisor mapping to the corresponding V divisor. So it's, this is obviously surjective. It's also injective um, because um, if you've got this Cartier divisor, it means you take a cover and you choose functions on here. And if it's injective, um, it means that each function Ki um, has image, has no zeros or poles on the open set Ui. Um, and um, this means it must actually be a unit of um, the coordinate ring of the open set Ui. Um, um, so, uh, here, here we're using the fact that if something on one of these open sets has no zeros or poles, then it must actually be a unit uh, in, in the case of the affine line. Um, so, so the Cartier divisor is, um, must then be trivial. So in other words, Cartier divisors are really the same as Vey divisors in this case. And you may think that this sort of argument applies much more generally the, the, than the affine line. And you're sort of right. In many cases, Cartier divisors are the same as Vey divisors. Um, so what we'll do next lecture is we'll give a couple of examples where the map from Cartier divisors to Vey divisors is neither injective nor surjective.